Happy people aren't as focused on treating themselves. They treat themselves by helping other people. You know, they donate more to charity. They give their time to volunteer causes. You know, the path to true well-being seems to come from being other-oriented rather than being selfish. I'm Juan Drupal here, host of the Broken Brain Podcast. Today, we're talking about happiness. We're talking about it because it turns out human beings are not very good at understanding what truly brings them happiness joy and contentment. To talk to us about the subject, we have Professor Dr. Lori Santos here from Yale University. She started a course on happiness because she saw how unhappy and how anxious and how depressed many of her students were. So she wanted to bring evidence-based tools to them. Her course became wildly popular, one of the most popular courses in Yale's history, and the online version has been taken by over 2 million people from around the globe. Lori's gonna break down the concept of happiness and we're gonna go into many of the myths of what brings us and especially doesn't bring us happiness. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast where we dive deep into the topics of neuroplasticity, epigenetics, mindfulness, functional medicine, and mindset, all with the goal of helping you understand that your brain is not broken. I'm your host, Drew Prode, and each week my team and I bring on a new guest who we think can help you improve your brain health feel better, and most importantly, live more. This week's guest is Dr. Lori Santos. Lori is a professor of psychology and the head of the Sillman College at Yale University, as well as the host of the critically acclaimed podcast, The Happiness Lab. If you aren't subscribed, it's in the show notes. Click on it. Some fantastic episodes there. Her course Psychology and the Good Life became the most popular course in Yale's history, and the online version of it has reached almost 2 million people from around the world. Lori, thank you first and foremost for being here and welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on the show. I want to acknowledge you because I really enjoyed the interview that you did with uh, my business partner, Dr. Mark Hyman. I thought it was fantastic. And inside of there, you know, this was kind of before a lot of the protest and the increased awareness that we're seeing around racial injustice and the plight that black people face every day with the death of, of all, the re, all the recent deaths that have been happening. Um, and so I wanted to first start off and pull a quote that you had shared inside that interview, which was, inequality has a lot to do with happiness. I want you to expand on that a little bit. And if possible, help us look through the world of your eyes, how a happiness expert looks at the world and the current racial pandemic that we're going through. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, th there's a lot of intuitions that we have about how happiness works, right? You know, we think being rich makes us happy. But actually, if you look across countries, wealth doesn't necessarily predict happiness, but wealth inequality at the country level tends to predict happiness. So if you live in a country like the United States, that tends to be, you know, relatively well off, but with a hugely unequal wealth level, you tend to find that happiness isn't as high as somewhere that had a kind of equal amount of wealth, but that the distribution was a little bit better, right? There weren't like a bunch of rich folks and a bunch of poor folks. And so that's just wealth inequality, but I think this maps onto all the kind of inequalities we know about, right? Like if you're from a group that is living with the structure of racism or sexism or ableism or all the isms out there, like it just sucks, right? You're constantly experiencing discrimination and prejudice that people from non-marginalized groups don't even see, right? And the, the kind of trauma and the, the like awfulness that comes from that, like takes a hit on your physical health, we know, right? But it also takes a huge hit on your mental health. Um, but I think it's not just folks from marginalized groups who experience this. Even if you're an ally from a non-marginalized group, like it sucks to realize that there are structures out there that are disproportionately hurting the people you care about and the people in your community. And so I think when we're faced with the kind of anti-Black racism that's coming up, the anti-Black violence that all of us have known about for a long time, but I think are seeing in a slightly different way after the video of George Floyd came out, like this is a huge hit to our well-being. And so I think that finding ways to take active steps to fight that racism, to not kind of just be, um, as some folks have referred to, like not just non-racist, but to be actively anti-racist is an important transition that we can use to kind of help society feel better, but also to help our own well-being. Um, I know many allies who, who may not like 
be a black person themselves, but who are faced with this crisis are just feeling really yucky and kind of dealing with the guilt that maybe they hadn't done enough that they could have done before, right? And I think the act of sort of speaking out and taking action um, can really do a lot to help even allies sort of feel like they're doing something, right? Like they're not powerless in the face of all this inequality. Mm, that's great. And I think that's the key is the speaking out and taking action because we know from so much of your work that there is something about when we feel that we're part of something bigger that those are contributing factors to our own happiness that we feel like we're making the world a better place. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things we get from the literature on happiness is that, you know, we, we often think of happiness as coming from like just having positive emotions, right? Like we're happy and joyful all the time and we don't experience sadness and anger and so on. But if you look at really how happiness is measured, th those positive emotions, kind of being happy in your life is only really half of it. You know, another big half of how we measure happiness is kind of be maybe better defined as being happy with your life. It's how satisfied you are with your life. It's how you think, is whether or not you think your life has purpose and has meaning and so on. And, you know, I think even if you're a person that doesn't necessarily identify as black, you know, recognizing that you live in a world with such structural inequality, you know, where somebody can just be walking down the street and, and experience legal violence from law enforcement personnel who are there to protect you, like, it's really hard to be satisfied with your life and satisfied with society when that's happening, right? And so I think it's really caused a lot of people to realize, hey, you know, even if it sucks to look at this stuff really closely, you know, a lot of people with the privilege of not having to look at it, right, because they're not black themselves, even though it sucks to look at this really closely, even though it makes you sad and angry and hurt, like the act of doing that is living a life of authenticity. Like the act of doing that is living a life that's really fighting this stuff that we really care about. And so the hope is that the pain that many of us are going through at the present moment, of course, people who are black right now, right, who are facing the kind of pain of this acutely and in a very special way, but even folks who will never know that pain, who just like are looking at structural racism, thinking that it's awful, like the act of fighting and, be, and kind of becoming anti-racist as opposed to just kind of like trying to look away, like despite the pain that comes with that, there's a real huge benefit that can come with that too, right? Like all of us are authentically fighting for the kind of world that we really want to see. And there's a special sort of meaningful happiness that comes with that. It's not to say that it doesn't suck to face that stuff head on like it does. I think that's the kind of collective pain that we're all reckoning with as a country. But the other side of that collective pain um, it is really kind of better off. So I want to talk a little bit more about that, but we'll come, we'll come back to that. And I know there's some questions that people have around navigating the inflow of information and also how to maintain their sense of contentment so that they don't burn out, which I think a lot of people are experiencing. But let's give people some context and start off with origin story. So before we go into the you teaching the course and your work at Yale and how this all got started, let's talk about your childhood and early life. How did you think about happiness? And do you remember being taught about it by anybody around you? Yeah, I mean, honestly, not really. I mean, I think, uh, you know, if I think back to my childhood, you know, I always kind of, even though I didn't really know what being a psychologist was, I always kind of was kind of fascinated with human psychology and human nature. Um, I think people were always like a big puzzle to me because, you know, as, as you know, in your podcast, like we don't have broken brains, but our brains are a little weird, you know, they're like quirky, right? And we really need to understand how they work if we want to build better lives and build better societies and stuff. So as long as I can remember, I was like, the kid that would, you know, sit around the adult table to like figure out what everyone was going on and like what adults were doing. I kind of remember being a little bit more anthropological even as a kid. And um, was that from a place of like, you're trying to understand their motivations? Is it like pattern recognition? Like, okay, why does this person do this thing? Like, what, what, what were you trying to dig into and find out? Yeah, I mean, I think people are just really fascinating to me, especially people's mistakes and their biases um, in the face of evidence that things are really bad. Um, so one of the things that, uh, you know, I admit in pleasant company, but I'm not entirely proud of is that one of my favorite forms of leisure is reading really bad celebrity memoirs, you know, like kind of these sort of rags to riches stories where people's own personal choices make the riches story kind of go back to the rags. And I'm just fascinated with why we as humans, like, can make, you know, we can be this incredibly smart species that's like unparalleled in the natural kingdom, yet we're also really dumb when it comes to really simple things. And I think that was something I was fascinated with even early on, but I didn't really know that you could have a career studying that kind of stuff. And so once I got to college and I took introduction to psychology, I realized there were fields like comparative cognition where you could study what makes the human mind special. 
I was really just taken with this stuff, um, mostly just because it was fascinating. I feel like learning about all these biases is almost like reading these celebrity memoirs because you're seeing all these examples of people doing dumb stuff kind of writ large. Um, but also there was the promise that by understanding it, we could make it better. And so most of my early work before I got really into the work on well-being was about trying to understand the origins of some of these biases. You know, what, what makes people messed up? What makes us make bad economic decisions? What makes us follow the crowd? Um, those were the kinds of things I was focused on. Um, but, but the shift really happened to think more about the biases we have that mess, us our, that mess up our happiness um, when I took on a new role at Yale. So you mentioned that I'm uh, head of Silliman College on Yale's campus. Um, for folks that don't know, like Hogwarts style, like Yale University, like, that means that, you know, I'm, I live on campus with students in one of these residential colleges, which is like a kind of school within a school, almost like Gryffindor or Slytherin or something like that. Um, but in this world, I'm not teaching students magic, but, but I am on the ground with them, really working with them directly um, about what life is like and how to navigate college. And what I was seeing is that, you know, so many students were more depressed, more anxious, more stressed out than I remember being in college. Um, and if you look at the national statistics, like mental health disorders among young people is, is almost a national epidemic. Like it's really striking. You know, up to 40% of college students report being too depressed to function most days. Almost two thirds say that they experience overwhelming anxiety. And the scariest statistic is that more than one in 10 college students right now report seriously considering suicide in the last year. Like. I mean, this is really yucky stuff. And so I realized that, you know, if we want to be better as educators and if I wanted to do my job as a head of college, we needed to give students real tools to kind of fight these, um, to fight the depression and the stress and all the stuff that they're facing. And so I kind of retrained in this work on well-being with the hope that, you know, if students knew the evidence-based interventions they could put into effect, then maybe they would use them and maybe that would make this whole crisis that all of us are experiencing a little better. So it started off with the studies around like the anthropological, right? You just wanted to know like, why do people do what they do and more from a distance? Eventually it turned into the well-being of students, but in your digging and looking at it from a distance, was there ever a time that it turned back on you in your life and you were thinking like, wow, these are the things that actually I've been doing without even knowing that are contributing to my fundamental contentment, happiness, and joy. And also, okay, maybe these are the things that I'm not doing, and that's why I feel like this area of my life is. So how did, how did you think about that well-being when it was pointed inwards to your own life? Yeah, well, it was a lot more the latter, unfortunately. I feel like, you know, I think one of the reasons I was so taken with the crisis that students were facing was that, you know, I could see a lot of the bad choices they were making in the way I was living my life, you know? Like, I was thinking that, you know, oh, my gosh, all they care about is work and grades, and I'm watching them not prioritize their social lives and exercise and their mental health and just being present, right? I'm watching them kind of fast forward to their summer internship or fast forward to when they graduate. And I saw all those inklings in myself, you know, like I watched myself not prioritize the right stuff when things got bad. Um, and so, you know, part of the class was for the students, but I realized that if I taught this class, I was going to have to practice what I was preaching, right? Like I, if I was going to preach to them, Hey, do X, Y, and Z intervention to promote your well-being, I was going to have to engage in those interventions myself. And secretly, I kind of knew I, I needed them, right? Um, in, in my class and on my podcast, I regularly admit that, like, I'm not one of those people who are kind of genetically pre-wired to be happy. Um, I'm not one of the lucky, you know, 40% or so that have some predisposition for this stuff. Um, I'm the kind of person whose instinct is to do the wrong thing a lot of the time. Um, and so the class and teaching all this stuff has wound up being a lot for me, you know, almost as it is as much as it is for my listeners and my students. It's fantastic. So let's go there. You know, you were hanging out with students. You were mentioned before in other interviews and articles that you would sit and you'd sit with them at the dining hall. You'd hear their stories. You'd see what people were going through and you thought, okay, there has to be a better solution that I can present. That ultimately led to the idea of teaching a class and putting a class together and the expectations in the class were like, okay, maybe some people will take this. It could be fun. You know, maybe I'll have some students show up and tell us what actually ended up happening. Yeah. Uh, what happened was a little surreal. Um, we ended up teaching the class for over a thousand students, which just to get a sense at the population at Yale, that wound up being just under a quarter of the entire Yale college student body. Um, which, as I said, was a little surreal. It posed a bunch of logistical problems of how to fit, you know, a quarter of the student body into a classroom, you know, twice a week. 
Um, but I think it taught me something even more important, which is that, you know, students are voting with their feet. Like they don't like this culture of feeling overwhelmed and anxious. I think they wanted some solutions, but most they wanted evidence-based solutions. You know, they didn't want to hear platitudes from their professors. They were kind of like, give me what the data suggests about how I can really fix this stuff. And that was really important. I think, you know, it really became kind of this, this strange movement on campus to talk openly about student mental health issues and what students could do to feel better. So you prepared a course and intentionally designed it to talk about what's there, what do we know, and what's the evidence around happiness. If you talk to most people or you stop most people on the street, I think a lot of people have this feeling internally that I should just know how to be happy and human beings should just know how to be happy. And in a way, sometimes that idea, well-intended, but sometimes it's wrong because we forget the fact that whether we've gone to a class on happiness or a course on happiness or not, society is teaching us a course from the time that we're young. So what are some of the things that we're learning from society that end up becoming the foundation around the expectations that we have around happiness? Yeah, well, I think the biggest societal one comes from like growing up implicitly in a capitalist society where we think you know, the path to happiness is paved with money and stuff. You know, if I could just earn a little bit more, get the perfect job, get the perfect house, like we think that we need to have better circumstances to be happier, especially in terms of money and material possessions. Um, you know, is that really the case? Well, you know, if you're listening to this podcast and you can't put a roof over your head because you don't have enough money or you can't put food on the table, yes, definitely getting access to more financial resources is essential. It's going to be huge for your well-being. But, you know, if you're reasonably middle class and you're not facing those issues, the data really suggests that more money isn't going to make us as happy as we think. Um, one of the studies that I talk a lot about in class suggests that right now in the U.S., if you're earning around $75,000, then even doubling or tripling your salary isn't going to increase your positive emotion. It's not going to reduce your negative affect. It's not even going to reduce your stress levels. Like we just don't realize that money isn't going to have the kind of bang for our buck, no pun intended, on our well-being that we often think. Um, the same is true for material possessions. Um, you know, many of us think like if I could just get the perfect house or like a super fancy car, I would, you know, be happier or feel better. Turns out there is a correlation between materialism and happiness, but it's a negative correlation. What does that mean? That means as you become more materialistic, as you seek out more material stuff, on average, your happiness goes up, goes down rather than goes up. So like the material stuff isn't working in the way we think. And so I think this is critical. I think, you know, society is selling us a bill of goods that like this is the path to happiness, but by and large, it's wrong. And I think that's really critical. It means many of us have internalized these intuitions. So it's not like we're not working on our happiness. We're actively going out and trying to do that, but we're just doing it in this wrong way. And all that work we're putting in is at an opportunity cost of investing in the stuff that really could make us happy. I find looking back at history is a great way for me to understand the current events that are happening, both with systemic racial injustice and also when it comes to like happiness. So we talk about society selling us this idea. If you look back in modern human history, there wasn't always this idea that material possessions or money would make us feel this way, would give us a thing that we're missing, would fill the void. What do you think are key events when you look back at history that started to take us in that direction that materialism was the way to fill the happiness voids? Yeah, well, I mean, with the caveat that I'm no historian, right, I'm much better at the psychological biases than kind of where they came from. I mean, I think there are a couple of things that are pretty huge here. Um, one of them is like the Industrial Revolution, right? Um, you know, we oftentimes look back in history and be like, oh, this was such a wonderful time. And to be fair, if you, you know, rewind to the Industrial Revolution, you know, a lot more systemic <laughs> injustice, a lot more racism, a lot more of all the isms we're talking about now. But there were still a few things that they had back then that were pretty good. Like as we bring in this idea that, you know, the, that companies can control time, that we're supposed to be working all the time, we're supposed to be making money all the time. Um, you know, those kinds of ideas, I think, messed with the typical notions that we had. You know, one of them isn't necessarily what we're buying and what we're spending money on, but just how we're spending our time. 
you know, that work is king, that productivity is king, right? That, you know, we're kind of put, putting a price tag on the way we spend our time. And it's, you know, kind of allowing us to overvalue like productivity and, you know, what good capitalism would want us to do over things like helping other people, spending time with other people, you know, just simply being present, leisure and just doing nothing, right? So I feel like, you know, that it, if there was one step on a kind of bad path that put us on there, you know, I think of what life was like then. Um, and as part of my podcast, I did an interesting interview with uh, Tom Hodgkinson, who uh, started a company called The Idler. Um, so he's a self-proclaimed idler. He kind of wants to fight the cult of busyness that so many of us face. And I feel like his fight is a really hard fight, you know, especially if I look out at my students today who are just like working incredibly hard. And if anything, when they finally get some leisure time, are almost like anxious because they're not, you know, sure what to do with themselves anymore. Um, and that's just kind of heartbreaking to see up close. But I think, you know, it's a feature of society that, again, we're kind of we're kind of fed these intuitions that, you know, if we're not being productive, we really need to be anxious. And you know, just sitting around and being still and doing nothing, like, how are you going to buy stuff if you do that, right? And, you know, so I think these notions kind of do seep in much more deeply than we expect. So we hit on the first one, which is materialism and money and what that looks like. What was the next big one or one of the big ones that you were sharing with the students where there was this aha moment in terms of what the evidence supported or didn't support when it came to our internal happiness? Yeah, I think another one that was really hard for them, another kind of mistaken intuition they have is about their grades, right? You know, especially at Yale, you know, there's a sense that like, you know, happiness comes from, you know, a perfect transcript, like happiness comes from all those straight A's. And I think my students, more so than maybe any other students on the planet, benefited a lot by having that intuition over time. But that's another spot where the data really go in the opposite direction. Um, there's evidence from uh, the education researcher Alfie Cohn and his colleagues that there's an inverse correlation between good grades and happiness. In other words, the kids that are getting the best grades right now in high school are actually the ones who, statistically speaking, might be the least happy. Um, Cohen has data that they're also uh, the least optimistic and have the lowest levels of self-worth, which again is not what we think, but you know, by making education all about getting perfect grades and these external rewards, Basically, what we've done is that we've taught students that, you know, there's not an internal reward for learning. It's this external thing, you know, you can get the perfect grades and get into the perfect school and get the perfect job and so on. And that does a couple things. One is it makes students really anxious, right? Like they get really scared that they're not going to reap the spoils of this war, you know, in terms of getting perfect grades. Um, but it also turns like what should be kind of fun, like learning about all these cool concepts into work. Right. It moves students away from what they really want to study and puts them in the mindset of like, well, how can I you know, use my education to do something in the world? It makes them all pre-professional. Um, you know, it has a whole host of consequences to the educational system and how much fun it is for students that I think ultimately make people less good people. And, and the data are starting to suggest less creative people. You know, our students are who are really worried about grades will pick, you know, the easiest paper to do, you know, because that's the best way to get what they're shooting for, which is the perfect grade. Um, it makes it more likely the data really suggests that students will cheat because if the point isn't to learn the material, if the point is just to get a perfect grade, then, you know, if you can get away with it, you know, that's a really good way to do it. And so the structures that we've created and the prioritization that we have about, you know, perfect grades and productivity at all costs, I think is really hurting education and it's really hurting our students' emotional health too. And so much of that just comes back to expectations, expectations from parents, expectations from kids, and also expectations of the school systems that people were brought in. If you had a magic wand, Harry Potter style, and you could look at things through a different lens, starting from the earliest education, what would be some of the things that you would bring in that could reorient us and still help us value hard work and studying to master certain subjects, but maybe re- wire some of these expectations that not just kids have, but the families and the school systems around them? Yeah, well, I think the first thing I would do is just like get rid of grades, which sounds like, you know, apocryphal, like how, you know, like how could you possibly do that? Um, but then if you really look back, grades actually haven't been around for that long. In fact, they were embarrassingly invented at, at Yale um, for like long ago, President Ezra Stiles back in the 1700s just decided, hey, I should scribble down who did what in this class that I was teaching. And that uh, he scribbled it down at four different levels, uh, which he wrote down in Latin. 
And that kind of translated eventually into the 4.0 we know today. But, but what that means is grades are only a couple hundred years old. You know, we've been educating people for a long time before them. And I think that's what we need to go back to. You know, you, you ask the question, like, what could pe get people to want to learn and be productive, you know, in the absence of those rewards? And I think, like, naturally humans are a curious species like we want to learn stuff like we get internal rewards from figuring stuff out and the problem is that when you slap an external reward on something all of a sudden it becomes something you have to do you're not just doing it because you like it anymore and that can bring in all the kind of feeling forced to do it and the rebellion and the anxiety that comes with grades um, but if you look at how kids learn early on like they want to be learning until you slap a grade on it um, some wonderful early studies back in the 1970s looked at this in, in little kids where they gave little kids little puzzles to do, little anagrams. Um, and some were super easy and some were really hard. And normally what happens is students want to do the ones that are like as hard as they can possibly do but still get it, right, where they're really kind of pushing themselves. Those are the ones that kids find most fun. But then these researchers then did maybe what you're expecting, which is that they now slap a grade on it. So instead of just doing it for fun, you're going to get graded on these anagrams. What happens? all of a sudden students would rather do the easy ones. Like the hard ones are just scary because like, you know, you don't want to show that you're a not smart person, you know, in my air quotes. And again, what that suggests is that the act of doing grading is killing something that's deep down, which is that like we all have a natural tendency to want to learn and be creative and share our ideas with others. But once we put people in a grading context, some of that stuff goes away. Mm. Seth Godin, uh, the author and, uh, you know, just philosopher. I think of him as a philosopher. He has this uh, great TED talk. I think it's called Stop Stealing Our Dreams, where he goes into the origin story of school and how school in our modern day and sense was really a byproduct of the industrial complex wanting to raise competent enough workers who could read instructions, follow the rules. So school initially was designed around being obedient and memorization, all the things that you needed to work in a factory at a higher level, going from the farm to the factory level. And that's why so much emphasis was placed on memory and, and just following instructions. And I often think about that when it comes to, you know, he has this powerful question in the TED Talk. He says, we have to ask ourselves, what is school for? And when we look at a lot of education, you would hope that education was for the contribution of not just our growth, but our own happiness so we can be better contributors to the world. And anytime we forget, it's always good to go back to the basic questions and really ask yourself, like, what's the point of all this? What's the point of everything around us? And why are we here? Yeah. And I think that can be really powerful, right? In, in two different ways. One is, uh, one is relevant to the conversation that we're having right now in terms of anti-black racism and anti-black violence, right? You know, what, what is law enforcement for? And when you kind of dig in, you look and you're like, oh, it was kind of to like, you know, make sure the slaves stayed with where they were supposed to be, you know, doing their work so that capitalism could continue and companies could make money. You're like, oh, when you look at the history, I think that's true for education. It was like, oh, it wasn't to like make us better, happier people and like make a better society. It was like to train people to go into the workforce in the way we needed them. Um, I think so much of the way we structure societies is, is based on this internalized notion that capitalism is the right way to go. It's like the moral way to go, and it's definitely the way to increase our well-being. But I think this comes from some of our mistaken intuitions. If you dig into the stuff we don't realize is good for happiness, but really is essential for it, it's things like having some bandwidth. It's things like having some time off. It's things like being present. It's, it's prioritizing our social relationships. It's not self-care, but doing care for others, right? It's being community-minded. Like, none of that stuff is built into the structure of capitalism. None of that stuff is built into the structure of ed our education system, for the most part. And so I think this view of thinking about what really matters for happiness doesn't just give us interventions we can use on ourselves to feel better. You know, I should be more present or I should be more social. It also causes us to start rethinking structurally the way we want society to be designed, right? Because so many of the structures we've built aren't necessarily maximizing well-being. Um, they're kind of, you know, maximizing shareholder profits, for example, not to sound too Marxist, but, but I think once we start thinking from the perspective of what science really tells us about um, becoming happier, it causes us to question our institutions. Um, and this is really critical because, you know, like, I don't think, you know, over time as we built these institutions, we were trying to do anything bad. We were just using our intuitions about what would make for a good society. But I think what the science shows us is that those intuitions are systematically off, right? They're systematically not paying attention to certain features that would make us happy. 
And so in some sense, it's no surprise that we design things that are kind of sucking and that are sort of stealing our well-being. But if you understand the right way to do things, it suggests, again, not just intervening to change your own happiness and to improve your own well-being, but it suggests strongly that we need, might need to restructure some of these institutions um, to make for happier societies over time. Yeah, and I think the beautiful thing is that, you know, we're in control and we can step, we can step in, we can speak up. I love being, you know, separately from being a podcast host, which I just do for fun. I love building businesses. I love employing people. I love leveraging the tools of capitalism. And again, I get to create my own definition out of it. Maybe it's conscious capitalism. Maybe it's thinking about the different stakeholders that are there that normally is not taught about in business school and seeing how can we take care of everybody? Because when everybody wins, we're at a better you know, society uh, that's there. So I think that that's a beautiful reminder that we can step into it and we can make this what we want it to be. And we don't just have to blindly follow the past. So I want to shift. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, please. I think that's one of the awesome things about this awful crisis of COVID-19 that we're all facing as you and I are having this conversation right now in the middle of like June 2020, right? I mean, obviously, this is an awful virus that's taking people's lives and it's hurting people's livelihoods. But I think it's kind of forced us to hit pause on things in this interesting way, right? Like it's forced us to ask like, could our lifestyles look different? Could the way businesses work look different? You know, do we have to be, you know, polluting as much as we have been and contributing to climate change as much as we have been? Like maybe we, you know, don't have to drive to work today, maybe all the time, like maybe we could work from home. Like, and so I don't know if we've gotten answers to those questions, but I think COVID-19 has been this interesting moment that's given us space to imagine what a new society could be like. It's also given some of us time and the bandwidth to imagine that, right? Because we've kind of hit pause on like the normal speeding through capitalist lifestyle that many of us face. And I think in the moment of doing that, we could ask, okay, what do we want our systems to look like? Um, you know, when this is all over and everything kind of reopens or we kind of reimagine society kind of post COVID-19, you know, are there changes that we want to make structural changes, big changes, as well as personal changes to our own life and how we live that, you know, might improve our well-being. Well said. And I think in addition to, the, you know, we're talking about capitalism. I think it's also institutionalism. Anything that's an institution, regardless of what institution is following, you can have institutionalism in religion. You can have institutionalism, you know, my background is I'm from India. There was the caste system that was there. That was an institution through combination of religion and state to keep people, you know, in one particular group and not have upward mobility. So any institution that is suppressing the natural flow of things is always going to be against what's in the best interest of, of human beings. And this is really a time period for us questioning all institutions. It's like, do we need this same type of hierarchy here? Or do we want to let people go and create something new that others can get a chance to experience? So I, I want to shift for, uh, I want to shift to other subjects that you covered. What does the literature teach us about happiness, joy, and contentment when it comes to the relationships in our lives. Yeah, well, I think the literature is pretty clear on this, which is important. I mean, as you know, in psychology, you know, there's always, you know, you know, some evidence that kind of goes in the opposite direction. This is one where I feel like literally every study I've read in positive psychology points in the same direction, which is that relationships are a key to happiness. Um, one very famous study say, said that high social connection is a necessary and sufficient condition for happiness, right? Like happy people just have strong relationships. Um, and the opposite of that kind of feeling lonely, we know is awful for well-being, but also awful for our physical health. Um, the recent Surgeon General uh, once reported that loneliness is almost as bad for your physical health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day, right? And, you know, we have a whole anti-smoking campaigns, but we don't have as much of a like campaign that's like pro-social connection, you know, work less hours at work so you can like see your family or, you know, make sure you're prioritizing social connection in your life. That's going to be as important for living a good life as getting the perfect job and so on. And so, you know, the data really suggests that that kind of connection is critical. And it's also kind of the kind of connection we get, not just, I mean, part of it's kind of being around people and having these strong relationships, but part of it is really being less focused on yourself and just more other oriented in general. And I think this is another spot where our society totally gets it wrong. You know, we all have notions of kind of self-care, 
or treat yourself if you watch Parks and Recs. You know, this is like, you know, people have t-shirts with this stuff, like treat yourself. But the data from happy people suggests happy people aren't as focused on treating themselves. They treat themselves by helping other people. You know, they donate more to charity. They give their time to volunteer causes. You know, the path to true well-being seems to come from being other-oriented rather than being selfish. When you first started teaching this material and you've been very open in your podcast and earlier in this interview, you said that, I was trying to learn this myself. Where would you have categorized the close relationships in your life and friendships uh, prior to diving super deep into the the literature? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm probably like a lot of people on this um, in the sense that it's not so much that I wouldn't have characterized them as important. You know, I would have said that my friendships and my marriage and my family relationships were really important. But, you know, if I pulled out my calendar and I looked at how much time I was really spending investing in those, if I was being honest, it would be less than it should, given how important it was, right? And I think that this is what a lot of busy, a lot of successful people realize. It's like, you know, you have this sense that those things are really important, but when push comes to shove and you look at what you're really investing in, it tends to not be that. Right. Um, and this is something for our podcast. We did a recent interview with Vivek Murthy, who's the former Surgeon General, who's a really important book on, on loneliness um, called Together right now. You know, he kind of said the same thing. He went through this realization where he, you know, knew the literature on this stuff, but when he really looked at how much time he was spending at work, you know, how many, how many of those extra projects wound up on his calendar, you know, how many dinners he had to miss with his kids, like you know, there's one thing to kind of know it's important, and then there's another to like really put it into practice. Um, and that involves often making hard choices. It involves not prioritizing accolades and success at work. Um, it involves something that's super hard in the present moment, which is like carving out more time, right? To really invest in relationships, you need to kind of feel like you have enough free time to do so. And those things are hard. And, you know, teaching all this stuff made me realize I need to do better. You know, am I perfect right now? Like, no, sadly, you know, but as a work in progress, I think I realized, you know, it is something that you need to put intention into prioritizing just like you do for your career. When I look at some of the cultures that you talk about that are some of the happier cultures, Scandinavian countries, uh, some of the Latin American countries, you know, talk about Costa Rica, they uh, seem to have, many of these cultures have rituals baked in. And rituals are a beautiful way that your immediate tribe and community are all agreeing that this is a time period to do something together. Because they're, I'm sure, you know, have their own busyness that they have to deal with and face with on a daily basis. And I've always loved the idea of rituals. And I think that one of the things that's happened in the culture that we're in is Yes, it's beautiful. We get to experience a lot of different traditions and and see what people are up to, but there's not as many baked in rituals into our own lives of deciding to slow down together or enjoy a meal together that doesn't let us feel like, okay, I have to stop working today and it's just me who's going to have to go spend time with my family. Everybody's coming and doing this together. So you mentioned interviewing uh, Vivek Murthy and when it comes to your own life, how do you think about those rituals or any hacks do you have of how we can bake in the idea of regularly having those relationships and connections to slow down together? Yeah, I mean, just to validate, it's super hard, right? You know, because many of us don't necessarily have the luxury of a culture that's doing that stuff. You know, maybe you have a lot of Scandinavian podcast listeners and they're like, I'm good. Like I have Hugo, I like chilling with my friends. But you know, if you're an American podcast listener and the fast paced life that many of us find ourselves in, you don't necessarily have that baked in. But the good news is that we all can set norms in our own little local cultures. You know, maybe American culture is not prioritizing that, but you know, many of us work in businesses where we have the culture of our organization, or our teams, you know, all of us live in family groups that have a culture in our family where we can promote that stuff. And I think at those little local levels, we can make decisions to include more of these rituals, to set up norms that, you know, family time is important and it's non-negotiable, you know, or, or to kind of deal with family time in special ways. You know, family time is a time when we don't have our phones and the phones get put away. Or, you know, weekends are a time when everybody puts their laptop away and no one's working, right? Um, we do have control of our own local cultures. Um, and I think it's really important to set those controls, especially for those of us who are in leadership positions, right? Um, you know, if you work for a company and you're kind of in a leadership role among a team, like, you know, everyone in your team is going to look to you as in terms of what your culture is like. And so I'm cognizant of that even in my labs and in Silliman that, 
you know, if I'm preaching this stuff, but I'm not prioritizing it myself, like they can see it, you know, like if I'm telling them like, oh, you know, don't, don't work during lunch and have conversations with your friends, but I whip out my laptop, they're going to see that too. And so part of setting up those norms is like living up to them yourself, which is, you know, the hard part of where that comes in, but it's also really important. And so much of what you teach is that these tools and techniques that can actually bring a lot of happiness and experiences into our lives, they're very free and they don't have to take, they're, they're free, not very free. Well, I guess they are very free too. They're <laughs> free and they don't have to take a ton of time. I, I do this thing where uh, every month, once a month, we have a team call with my team. You know, I have about 60 employees in my in different companies and we take one of those groups and everybody just goes around the table and shares some gratitude about something that's there. And we do that in the work environment, right? This is people are getting paid for their time here. They're all on the phone. They're sharing gratitude and they're dishing it out and getting a uh, chance to like pass the baton on around somebody who supported them or recommended a book or helped them with a tough project. And that doesn't really cost that much. It's like a 30 minute call. Everybody hops on, we go around the table and yet the joy that it creates in the team unity and the amount that it helps us perform better is just fantastic. So it doesn't have to be crazy experiences. It can be small little things that are freely available to us. Yeah. And I think that's so powerful. I mean, two things there. One is the free part, right? Like, you know, you don't have to like pay some self-help guru to like, you know, do some crazy program. Like all these interventions are just really straightforward and they're not, you don't have to buy anything, which is kind of awesome, right? Which means it's like completely easily accessible for people across income levels, across different circumstances. But I think the second thing is like, these things do take time, but they actually don't take that much time. Like the benefit you get from them is kind of like surprising given the amount of time you really need to put in. You know, like your statements of gratitude, my guess is that that's probably like, you know, you go around to everybody and it takes some time in the meeting, but it's not like hours and hours, you know, you do this for like five, 10 minutes and you get this little blast of joy. And I think so many of the activities we're recommending, like just have those features, right? Like they're going to take a little bit of time to make sure you're socially connecting, or it's going to take a little bit of time to become more other oriented or experience gratitude or you know, take time to meditate and be present. But like, you know, the little five minutes and 10 minutes here and there, they have this like huge like benefit. And so the kind of like time to benefit ratio is actually quite powerful for these techniques too. Um, I think what we have to get over is, you know, what we sometimes like deal with in corporate culture, which is like, if we're being honest, some of this stuff sounds a little wooey, right? Like, you know, like, you know, when you walk into a corporate, you know, very corporate kind of culture meeting, like we're going to do gratitude and we're all going to take time to meditate and we're going to be other oriented. Like there are people in that room who want to like gag, right? And that's why, you know, our class I think has been so powerful. It's like what I'm showing people isn't, you know, this stuff isn't woo. Like this is evidence-based practices, just like the best stuff that we use in science. And so I think once people see the data that, you know, this stuff isn't kind of, sometimes I use the phrase hippie to feel, although I've had a lot of hippies kind of come at me for that and be like, hippies are good. Don't make fun of hippies. But, you know, like, but, like with, with the kind of, you know, hippie dippy and air quotes, like I think what the research suggests is it's not woo. This is, this is evidence-based stuff that really can make a huge difference in not that much amount of time. When you think about the top things that are culprits that most of us will face on a daily basis that suck away at our happiness, what are the culprits that are there that most of us encounter on a daily basis, just our normal daily life that have a tendency to eat away at our happiness? Um, I mean, I can speak about my own personal biggest ones. Um, for me, the biggest one these days is uh, time famine. Um, which is this like subjective sense that you just don't have any time. It's the opposite of what researchers like Ashley Willens call uh, time affluence, which is kind of just like feeling like you have some free time. Um, the data shows that just feeling time famine is itself a happiness sink. Um, Ashley Willens' data shows that people who feel very time famished have a well-being hit that is equivalent to being unemployed in the United States right now. Like that's how much it kills your well-being. Um, and what's surprising though is that we're all often making choices that make us more time famished rather than less, right? You know, we kind of say yes to too many things or we take on too many opportunities. And this is one, if I had to pick one that I'm working on a lot, it's kind of this one. And one that's kind of hard for me, you know, this sort of all the work that I've been doing on happiness has been so meaningful and so important. And it's given me many opportunities but it's given me a lot of opportunities, which has the cost of kind of taking up a lot of time. And so I've been kind of actively working on this one. And I noticed that when I do, when I feel more time free and less time poor, 
that makes it easier to kind of do the other things. I almost think of it as like a meta strategy for increasing my happiness. Because when I'm feeling time affluent, that's when I want to hang out with friends. You know, that's when I'm open to being present. That's when I have time to like, you know, take the scenic route and notice the good stuff out there and not just kind of feel so frantic. That's the kind of time when I feel like I have the bandwidth to do this other stuff. Um, you know, one of the things I've experienced in this current moment, you know, when we're all thinking so much about what we can do to curb racism, you know, if you're feeling kind of time famished, you just don't think you have the bandwidth to jump into like fixing the structural changes out there. Um, and Ashley Willens even has some lovely data on this. She shows that if you make people feel time famished, all of a sudden they recycle less. You know, you get, you get subjects and you make them kind of feel time famished and they won't even take the extra time to walk across the room and stick some garbage in a recycling bin. They'll just kind of throw it in the regular trash bin there. And so, you know, we don't often think that to fix the structural problems in the world, we need to give people more time. Um, but I actually think that could be quite powerful. And I actually think it's one of the reasons, I mean, there's lots of reasons why these conversations are happening in this moment. I mean, I think they're just needed and, you know, the specific incidents that come up are part of it. But I think part of it is like, some of us just have a little time windfall right now in COVID, right? And, you know, people aren't working as much or they have a different kind of commute. Like people are just feeling a little more time affluent than they've ever been. And it's maybe no surprise that this is the moment that we're kind of engaging with these issues even more, especially folks like folks who are from non-marginalized groups who like feel like they have the bandwidth to be allies right now and really step it up. I think part of that is just people just have some more time. And that could be one of the beautiful silver linings that comes from everything that happened with the coronavirus and the pandemic is slowing down and really getting a chance to ask yourself, what is important? Does it really matter? Do I need to be doing these things? Do we as a family want to run around to these you know, 15 different events and 13 different birthday parties or whatever it might be, or do every one of these sports or is slowing down. And it's an individual question. The honest truth is that there are some people that thrive in that environment and there's some people that don't. And I think this is where studying happiness is so key because we can learn and we can look at the evidence that's out there. And then individually, we can consciously make the decisions for us that are right for our, uh, our own unique um, state of the union and what really brings us uh, joy. When, when you think about your schedule and planning your schedule out now, is there something that you do on a practical level when it comes to time blocking or leaving some time off? Is there something that you do now, having gone through all this literature, that maybe you didn't do before when it comes to the practical aspect of putting your schedule together? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I do now that's different, well, first, you know, I think you might have emailed me and, and seen my kind of very over the top uh, email message when you emailed me that kind of just explains, hey, look, I'm, I'm like really trying to prioritize my time for the things that matter. And that might mean I don't email you back. And that's not because I don't care about it. It's just because, you know, there's an opportunity cost of every individual email I I send. And that opportunity cost is often time with my husband or time for my students or bandwidth for being present. And that's just not an opportunity cost I want to continue giving up um, or an opportunity cost I want to kind of, I want to make sure I'm kind of maximizing that cost benefit ratio uh, in a way that protects my well being. Um, I think the second thing I've done is really to try to like think about that opportunity cost when I'm saying yes to different kinds of opportunities that come up when I'm saying yes to the events that come up in my life. Um, a, a question that I've, I've been using a lot, especially in the time of COVID, is a question about nutrition. Um, in, in my class and just in general, I often use kind of analogies with like food and fitness when I think about well-being. Um, and I think this is really powerful here. You know, we need to think about the way that we spend our time and what's really nutritious. You know, it's not to say that we won't like do the non-nutrition thing on occasion, you know, play some crappy video game or like scroll on Reddit for too long. Like, you know, there, there can be the kind of like junk food of our time use, but we need to make sure that some of it is nutritious. And so what's nutritious for me? You know, what's nutritious for me is like really connecting well with an old friend or, you know, a really hard workout when things, you know, like are, are feeling down um, or making sure I'm prioritizing and getting sleep and other healthy practices, right? And so I've tried to really ask myself, you know, when I get asked to do stuff, is this going to be nutritious or is this going to make it harder for me to do nutritious stuff later? And I'll be the first to admit that I'm not perfect at that, but just kind of thinking in those terms, kind of mindfully paying attention to how the events are really impacting my well-being generally um, have mattered a lot. Um, a, a final time tip I'll give came from a conversation I had with Ashley Willens, who um, is just like my hero on the research on this stuff. She has this wonderful new book called Time Smart that I feel like everybody who's listening to this should get. 
Um, but she herself is a busy academic who went through this, gave me the, the idea of setting up what she called a, a time windfall list. Um, what's shocking about timing right now and the fact that so many of us feel time famished is that the research actually shows that we have more time rather than less. Like in the last few decades, we have more open time than we did even before, yet none of us feel like it. And the problem is that our time comes in different chunks. Right now, a lot of the free time we get is in what's, what researchers call time confetti. Like it's in little splotches here and there. And we often don't make the best use of our time confetti. You know, if a meeting ends early or something, you know, rather than do something that's really nutritious with my time, I often do like a quick email check or I'll just like plop on, you know, Twitter and see the latest awful stuff that's going on on the planet, right? Um, but Ashley recommends using that time more nutritiously and literally giving yourself a list to remind yourself what you need to do. You know, so I've done that now on my phone. I have a little list that says, you know, when I have some free time, like that's when I'm just going to take, you know, three deep breaths and just try to breathe or text a friend I haven't talked to in a while just to check in, right? Like not do email, not do the stuff for work because those things are always going to be there. But what can you do with those windfalls that's really nutritious for your own happiness? Um, mm. And that's been you know, a huge tip that's been super helpful. I love that. It, it kind of makes me think of, uh, you know, one of the reasons that I chose to do a podcast is that most of my days in operations and meetings and running the companies that I run and a podcast is actually something that doesn't feel like work at all for me. It feels like a conscious opportunity to really study the new material. And how often in our life do we give another person, sometimes even our own partner or spouses, how often do we give another person an hour of our undivided attention to really connect? And previously, prior to everything coronavirus, I would do interviews in person. And I would insist on doing interviews in person because I just enjoyed the feeling of being there, sitting with someone looking at them in the eye, and it's just sharing this moment as two human beings. And I also knew that because it's also technically work-related, I wouldn't let myself get out of it. I wouldn't let myself be interrupted by it. I wouldn't cancel because now it's baked into my life. And I love thinking about different hacks like that. I read a book a few years ago by Gary Keller called The One Thing. And it's like, how can we pick one thing in our life that makes everything else better, more successful, and, you know, more purposeful in whatever it is that we want to do. And the podcast has been one of those goals for me. Another example of that is that I do work a lot and work brings me a lot of joy. I get a lot of joy from work. But part of the reason that work brings me a lot of joy is that I have hired about five or six of my close family and friends in the different companies that I work with. And so that's also an opportunity to get to chance to spend time with them. And so I'm always just thinking, how can I reverse engineer my own tendencies and enjoyments and try to bring together the things that I actually care about? Yeah, I love that. And I think, again, you know, we, we forget that we have a choice in a lot of this stuff, right? You know, not everybody, but a lot of people who are listening to this podcast are privileged enough to to shift around how they're spending some of their time. And we forget that we can use that to be happier in, in a lot of the ways you've talked about. Um, I think recognizing that many of the people listening have some agency here um, can be really powerful, especially in, in a time when everything else feels so stressful. Remembering that you have control over the interventions you put into your own life can be super powerful. So Lori, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and talking to our listeners about happiness and what they can learn from the literature. Before we talk about where people can find you, I want to just ask for one last tip. How do we maintain a sense of contentment and happiness and also be informed citizens of the world? I know a lot of people right now who are on Twitter, on Instagram and other places are kind of feeling it a little overwhelmed and feeling like they're losing a sense of their happiness. Any tips that you can share? Yeah, I mean, the one I use myself, again, gets back to this analogy of what's nutritious, right? Like completely putting your head in the sand and not paying attention to what's going on in the world is super not nutritious right now. But, you know, incubating in the 24-hour news cycle at all hours a day, including messing with your sleep and like, that might not be nutritious either. And so the advice I give is to kind of be mindful about how those interactions are making you feel right? Like there's no rule that says you have to be an activist 24 hours a day, right? It'd be much better off to engage with the things you can engage with, how much you can do it. And that is going to look different for different folks. Um, that's true for the kind of tough conversations we're having about systematic racism and violence right now. But it's also true for the tough statistics that we're all facing with COVID-19, right? There are times when you have the bandwidth to like look at all the scary numbers and then there's times when you don't. And so I think paying attention mindfully to what it's doing for you personally can be really powerful. 
Um, I watched, for example, my, my husband, you know, is kind of, he, he's sort of a nerd and he's kind of like a statistics junkie. And, you know, every day he looks at the COVID statistics and I like walk up to him when he's on his computer looking at this and I can watch my chest tighten and my stress hormones are spiking up, right? Like we just have different differences in how much we can naturally participate in that stuff. And that's cool. Again, there's no rule. What you need to figure out is what works for you and what's allowing you to do meaningful work in a way that's not burning you out. Mm. Well, the conversation will be continued. You have your happiness course online that we'll be linking to. You also have the Happiness Lab podcast that's there. Any other, where, any other place that you want to send our listeners? Yeah, definitely. Both of those would be fantastic. And you can follow me on Twitter at just my name, Laurie Santos, um, tweeting lots of resources about how to get through this current moment um, in ways that academics and beyond can kind of help in this fight against uh, structural racism. Lori, thank you for helping make the world a happier place. I want to acknowledge you for who you are and the work you're doing. Thank you for being on the Broken Rain Podcast. Thanks so much for having me.